Good morning. I have tried to stick to my assigned topic, as we see, manufactured terrorism then and now. My starting point, of course, is my book, 9-11 uh, Synthetic Terror, Made in USA. And I stress again, Made in USA. And if you see here, the fifth edition, which came out for the anniversary in 2011, is now up to 46 drills uh, through which the 9-11 events were prepared and then executed. And of these 46 drills, which are listed exhaustively and discussed in the book, about half of them occurred on the day of 9-11. So it was the day densest in drills of all of American history or world history, as far as I know. And of course, every essential aspect of the 9-11 event is covered by a drill. It corresponds to a drill which in my book means it was generated through a drill. Now, my approach uh, has not found favor. It has not been widely shared. And I'm, I have to tell you, I'm puzzled, because this is how covert operations are executed. You design a drill that looks very much like what you want, and then the drill goes live. And instead of having a fake or pretend attack, it becomes a real attack, and that can be done with very small changes and having very few people aware of it. In the book, I also propose this conceptual scheme. And as you will note, I, I'm, I'm all about conceptual schemes, uh, not, empiric, not empiricist. Try to be empirical, that's good, but don't be empiricist, that's bad. Don't be like John Locke, right? Look at the world but not through the eyes of John Locke or Hobbes or Hume or any of these people. And here we have the, the tripartite division, the patsies, the dupes, the useful idiots, fanatics, provocateurs, Oswalds, the professional killers or technicians, the old boys, the asteroids, right, the hired killers that uh, Perkins, I think, talks about in his book subsequent to this, and the moles. The moles are a network inside the government, but they're not a government network. It's not like Prussia, where government is a career, where people aspire to be permanent government officials. No, no, no. The US government is a revolving door, and the payoff comes in the private sector part. So it is not a government net, uh, get network fundamentally. It's a Wall Street private sector network that has penetrated the government, and this is fundamental because this is the part that the libertarians simply cannot understand. They see the government uh, as a force on its own. So the patsies, the professional killers, are technicians, probably technicians is good, and the moles. The government resources are accessed via drills, right? The, the resources for 9-11 are huge. No private sector entity really has all of them. The government does, but that's why you need the drill. The command center, privatized in the private sector, not subjected to government of state-sponsored false flag terrorism. False flag. And that's the big concept worldwide this week. And I want you to be of good cheer because false flag is on the agenda. A lot of people in the world are going to know what that is and have learned it now. Um, the uh, drills. Uh, I have 46. I can't even name them all. I don't have time. You'll have to buy my book. I'll be out here. I'll be out here in the afternoon. No, it's, it just can't be done. Um, Counterterrorism. This is one of the drills that prepared it, right? SEADS, the Southeast Air Defense System, right? They helpfully put bin Laden's picture or the picture of the actor who was playing bin Laden that week. Everyone participates. This was one that was going to start in Alaska, go across Canada, and get to New York. So it's an international drill. Now, you're going to have to bear with me, because I, I can't uh, submit to the, uh, the discipline of um, lists of facts. That's not my way. Uh, this is not a consensus report, right? This is, it tries to be an egregious one-man report. 
Uh, I don't have any approved statements. Uh, those things belong to the method of Aristotle. And I'm in the camp that will not uh, go with Aristotle, so I tried to get that, I tried to get the red line across Aristotle's face, but I couldn't do that, so <laughs> I did what I could. Instead, uh, I go with the other school, the Platonic one, uh, which is different. And remember, the Plato's cave, right? If we we think we get to certainty, and we think we can establish all the facts, uh, we have to remember that we are, in many ways, caught in the cave looking at the shadows that are projected on the wall. And of course, in our time, the shadow projected on the wall turned out to be 9-11. Uh, but 9-11 is an illusion. 9-11 is the intersection of the moles, the patsies, and the technicians, uh, and not the reality that most people think. Now, I am um, happy to say that the power of that concept, the molds, the patsies, the technicians, and the drills, is strong enough to penetrate even this uh, hostile book, right, Among the Truthers by Jonathan Kay. Um, he actually tells you in there that there's the method of the moles, the patsies, the drills, and the technicians. So in spite of his hostility, in spite of everything that he else that he throws up, he says that's the method that has won out among uh, many 9-11 activists. And of course, that became this debate on C-SPAN a year ago, April, which I believe is probably the main presence of 9-11 truth on U.S. national television last year. Maybe there were others, but that's certainly one of them. And the year before, I'm, I'm showing you these things to try to show that my method uh, has some modest contributions to, uh, to chalk up. In other words, it does get you somewhere. It does stir the pot to some extent. Here's The Guardian with our good friend Charlie Skelton. This was the Walker Street conference of two years ago. And if you want to get the drills in detail. I did the drills in excruciating detail at that conference. So get that. I think it's on tarpley.net. Anyway, this is Charlie Sheen, Charlie Skelton, sorry. And this is not a slander. This is basically endorsing 9-11 truth. It was probably the best article for that anniversary. And also, around the same time, August two years ago, the Süddeutsche Zeitung. This is Munich, right? Munich, Stuttgart, places like this. Truth and insanity conspiracy theories about 9-11. And again, this is a little bit nastier, but it's not a slander. It actually entertains uh, many, many facts. So this conceptual approach, which I recommend, does have a certain penetrating power, right? And here's my evidence. Now, the question always has been, will a government, will some powerful force in the world take up the cause of 9-11 truth and established this on the world stage. And there were great hopes for Ahmadinejad. Here I am with Ahmadinejad at the beginning of last year. I just gave him my 9-11 book. Uh, unfortunately, Ahmadinejad has now left office, and somehow this never gelled. But I think, I think he was a person of goodwill who wanted to do it. And I would have many positive things to say about him as a scientist, as someone who promoted economic development, and not at all as the person that you've, uh, that you've been told. But now, uh, which, and, and this is a situation reflected in, 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 in Mr. Gage's remarks, the remains of the 9-11 truth movement have to decide what their future will be. Will it be a narrowly focused, technical, and I would add, in many ways, apolitical research and activism effort, limited to 9-11 in isolation, and I think this, you get into the danger of antiquarianism. In other words, you begin to become fascinated by a, a, a moment frozen in amber. I don't think that's effective. I think the immense experience and sophistication and knowledge that has been built up here over these years would allow politically oriented researchers, researchers and activists to follow the unfolding series of covert operations and false flag events and denounce them and deflate them 
and refute them and try to counter them in the eyes of public opinion. And the big difference here is, instead of backward looking, this one is forward looking. Because it says, your fundamental task is, where's the next 9-11 coming from? And how do you be ready for that? And that is a completely different uh, approach. Now, false flag. False flag is one of our fundamental concepts. And in the course of this past two or three week period, there's been more discussion of false flags than in the entire time up to now. This is the interview, well, first of all, this is the president of Russia, V.V. Putin. And Putin, in his New York Times op-ed of a couple of days ago, says that the Syrian chemical weapons event, so-called, Guta, was a false flag. As soon as it happened, the Russian foreign ministry said, this is a pre-planned provocation. At the end of the G20 meeting, Putin said, this was done by the rebels, the terrorists in Syria. And now he says, this was a false flag. So that's one false flag, Guta. And he warns of another false flag. He says that another false flag is being prepared as an attack on Israel that will then be used to get the big war. Now this is what we have to pay attention to. This is where we are, right? We're now on the knife edge of a huge explosion. Here's Putin, Putin's text. Poison gas was used in Syria. Okay, but there's every reason to believe it was used not by the Syrian army, but by the opposition. And that means the rebels, the terrorists, the Al-Qaeda, Nusra, the emirs used by opposition forces to provoke intervention by their powerful foreign patrons. And it almost worked, and it still might work. Who would be siding with the fundamentalists? Reports that militants are preparing another attack, this time against Israel, cannot be ignored. Now, I can remember when Matt Sullivan and I would go to the White House in the spring of 2007 with signs saying, don't nuke Iran for Cheney's new 9-11. We were trying to, as best we could with our practically non-existent means, to inoculate public opinion against the coming false flag event. And now, it's a great power. It's a superpower. It's one of the five permanent members of the Security Council that has embraced publicly the concept of the false flag event. Now, that's a real achievement, and you should instead of worrying about how many people are in the room, consider this a, a piece of progress to which people here have contributed. And obviously, the KGB doesn't need lessons about false flag. They know about false flag. Any sophisticated person would. But the fact that this comes on the scene now, I think, is important. Now, Russia today, their television, has been talking for days now Syrian rebels plan a chemical attack on Israel from Assad-controlled territories. Now this, in some ways, puts the ball in our court. How are you mobilizing? What are you doing about this? How are you getting the word out, right? How are you showing that the world is now under the, under the shadow of World War III caused by a false flag, like Sarajevo, like the Gleivitz radio station, right? You're going to have it a third time? It's time to agitate, but not in the backward-looking way, not, not the... The, the old research, did you do that when you can, but to put this out. Say, look, I studied 9-11. I know what, what these things are, and this is what we do not want. Then there's the question of Al-Qaeda, right? What is it? Is it this demonic force? That's one version. The BBC then said, the BBC said there's no such thing as Al-Qaeda. Well, there is Al-Qaeda. And what I've, or my standard phrase in my books is, it's the CIA Arab Legion, it's dupes, patsies, fanatics, double agents, mercenaries, and what have you. And Al-Qaeda, in that sense, is uh, capable of blowing up a supermarket or a bus, but not the Twin Towers. But of course, what they're doing in Syria today, what they did in Libya two years ago, is very much on the supermarket and bus level, right? So it's, it, we, the Republicans are saying, the U.S. Air Force doesn't want to be, whoop, doesn't want to be the, uh, the Al-Qaeda Air Force. It's really the other way around, that Al-Qaeda is the NATO infantry. Al-Qaeda is the NATO infantry. 
and it's been used in Libya, Syria, Yemen, Algeria, Mali, Somalia, Iraq, and so forth. And Pakistani and Afghan Taliban, fresh from fighting the US, are now being shipped into Syria, where they're being armed by the CIA to fight Assad. Denounce these facts. Get the word out. Who is the evil genius of this phase? Now, this is not 9-11, but the current phase, this charming gentleman, right? Bandar Bush is the way you probably know him, right? Prince Bandar bin Sultan, the boss of Saudi intelligence. He's the prime suspect of the Gutha chemical attack. He's the one who provided the, the gas. And we're even talking now about a third earlier event, which is the Aleppo chemical event of March 19th. Russia now has a 100-page report, which seems to be in the hands of McClatchy News, where they show that the sarin gas was used by the rebels. And this is the authoritative one, because this has all the rules of evidence and the chain of custody, and it follows all the rules of the uh, the enforcement organism of the uh, Chemical Weapons Convention. A couple of other things that you probably don't know. A couple of journalists, Pierre Piccinin of Belgium and Domenico Quirico, a reporter for La Stampa, the main newspaper of uh, Turin, Italy. It's the Fiat uh, the newspaper. They were held for 152 days by the terrorists in Syria. And they actually say they were more like brigands, bandits, organized crime, mafiosi. They were held. And what they report is that when they were in one room, there was a general from the Free Syrian Army in the other room boasting that his forces had successfully carried out the Ghouta chemical attack. That's what they said when they got back. And you can see that on the internet. You can see Piccinin saying so in French. Critico was Critico, a much weaker guy. He was leaned on. So they've stopped talking about this. But that's what they said. Okay? Here is a person that I hope you get to know. This is Sister Agnès Mariam de la Croix. This was the person who made possible my trip to Syria in, uh, in November of 2011. She is the mother superior of the convent of St. James in Kara, Syria. It's about halfway from Damascus to Homs. And what she's recounting is that the children, the child victims that are displayed in the videos, the dozen or so videos of the chemical event, are not people from the Damascus suburbs, but they are Alawites. They're Alawite children kidnapped by the rebels in Latakia on the Mediterranean coast two weeks earlier. So the rebels grabbed a bunch of kids, killed them somehow, and then used them for the photo op to make those videos. That's what Kerry and Rice want to help, those butchers. And this is, this is, of course, the same method as the Nazis. This is the Gleiwitz radio station, Operation Canned Goods. You get people, you kill them, you kill them in the way that seems to be the way you want. Wait to the end, huh? Unless it's... Well, I just was saying, if it had been sarin, there would have been people vomiting all over the place. Yeah, not only vomiting, the, the, I don't want to go into this too much, but uh, uncontrolled defecation is, is one of the terminal symptoms, and you don't see any of that. So it's a fraud. And she is writing a report, and, uh, well, it may be possible to, uh, to make her influence felt in the U.S. Congress, because all this stuff is, everybody agrees that, Sada, that Assad carried out this gassing. No, no. And remember, from 9-11, you've got to recall this. If you grant the enemy the premise, you'll get the consequences. If you say, oh, yeah, we accept 9-11, but we don't like war, you'll get war. And if you say, oh, yeah, Assad gassed his people, then you're going to get war. That was the genius of 9-11 truth, that we don't accept their premise. Carter del Ponte of the United Nations also found a couple of months ago, the rebels are the ones who use the poison gas. Now, here is the, the point that I want to try to develop today. Here we have Professor Lance DeHaven Smith, right, from Florida. He writes about uh, conspiracy theory in America. This is a, this is a rather friendlier book. Uh, he says the whole idea of conspiracy theory being bad is from the CIA 
in the late 1960s. So it's a very interesting book. But here's the point that I think is important. You cannot consider covert operations or false flags one by one. No, you must consider them as part of a continuum because it's a series. You can't just say, I do the Kennedy assassination and not, you know, 9-11 or the other way around. No, that's methodologically bankrupt. You can't do it. Sorry. So you've got to study the continuum. And if for no other reason, right, here we are, we've got the 9-11 anniversary, but of course our calendar is dense with false flag anniversaries. We've now got the Kennedy 50-year anniversary coming up in November. So what do we make of this? I think it would have been, would have been good to get Joan Mellon or somebody else like this, right, some expert on, on the Kennedy assassination here to try to get that process going. But um, don't expect left liberals to help us on this, right? The Oliver Stone Kuznick movie, or Klutznick, as I like to call him in my local dialect. The <laughs> Oliver Stone Klutznick untold history of the United States, right? That's my, my North Queens uh, dialect. The, the history of the United States. Uh, Oliver Stone felt free to attack the Kennedy assassination myth in the movie JFK because it's a work of fiction. But when it comes to making historical, factual assertions, he doesn't make any. If you saw that on Star's television, it was on cable TV, right? And they, what was the, uh, the explanation on Kennedy? Kennedy had powerful enemies. Yeah, well, but how about the CIA operations directorate and all those people, Alan Dulles, Richard Bissell, whatever? No, not a word. So Oliver Stone has gone backwards away from attacking the Kennedy myth, and of course he never had anything to say about 9-11. So nothing on Kennedy, 9-11 accepted, Stimson, we'll get to that in a minute, is whitewashed. And here's what this comes down to. The left liberals are afraid to risk their own careers and social standing and whatever by going into the non-respectable realm of conspiracy theories. Of course, for some of us, it's too late. Right? <laughs> And instead, what they do, they don't want to risk their careers. They blame the American people. They say, oh, that great unwashed mass, they're racist, they're chauvinist, they're ignorant, they're this, they're that. Yeah, how about some organic intellectuals to lead, right? Some intelligentsia in the Russian sense. So this, I'm afraid, doesn't get us anywhere. Here's what I would like to point to. Here's a continuum. Now, let's just tick them off. The USS Maine in 1898 gives you the Spanish-American War. The McKinley assassination gives you the annexation of the Philippines and the founding of an empire. Sarajevo is not exactly the US. It's really British uh, Freemasons starting World War I. And then with Roosevelt, and I'm going I'm to have Roosevelt all through the talk, we have the assassination attempt against Roosevelt in 1933. Then we have the Morgan coup, right, the one you know, Smedley Butler, the Dick Stein Committee. That's 1934 to 35. But then we have the attempted coup by Van Horn Mosley, 1937, and the Von Siatsky coup of 41 to 42. And finally, we have the assassination of Franklin D. Roosevelt. That is my finding. By Wall Street, by the British by fascists, reactionaries, and so forth in the U.S. establishment. Right? And this is the big one, because this then puts the entire history of all of our lives under the shadow, not just the post-Kennedy, but the pre-Kennedy. So the killing of, of uh, Roosevelt by poison. The Kennedy assassination, 1963. The Gulf of Tonkin, 1964. Martin Luther King, 1968. Robert F. Kennedy, 1968. Watergate, now Watergate, many people wouldn't see it this way, but Watergate is a CIA Office of Naval Intelligence operation to attack and weaken the presidency. And the, uh, the House organ was Washington Post, which is the newspaper of the Federal Reserve System, always interested in a, yeah, they were. That's, who, that's how it was founded. It was founded by Eugene Meyer. The family is now selling it. Eugene Meyer bought it to fight Roosevelt and to, and to fight the uh, demonetization of gold. He was, a, he was a gold bug. 
We have two attempts on the life of Gerald Ford, right? Sarah Jane Moore and Lynette Squeaky Fromm. Then we have Hinckley trying to kill Reagan in 1982. We have Iran-Contra in the mid-'80s, 9-11, and now we have the Arab Spring, Egypt, Libya, Syria, and so forth. Now, that's a continuum. That's not even the whole continuum. Right? That's, those are just some of the most dramatic moments. It's quite a history, huh? The suppressed history. It's uh, the way this faction has expressed its, uh, its desires and demands. Now, what, what can we make? Can we make some generalizations about the continuum? I think, I think we can. We can, first of all, recall that Kennedy was assassinated, as I said before, by the CIA operations directorate. And Garrison, of course, on the right track, but then sabotaged and surrounded and, and cut off, while the great left liberals, uh, of course, weren't, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't do it. But here, here's the common basis, is that none of these events is for the good. They're all for the evil. They all promote evil. They promote war. They promote oppression. They promote genocidal austerity. They promote union busting. The people who get killed are generally the adversaries of Wall Street banks. Um, it's not a question of, you know, William Tell, right? William Tell in Switzerland wants to kill the, the occupiers, right? He wants to kill the tyrant Kessler in, in Schiller's famous play. It's not that. The people who get killed are good or better than average, uh, and, the good one, and the bad ones are left untouched, and it's actually amazing. And the consequences are bad. So from that continuum, we can deduce that there's a social formation behind it, and we can see what the policies of that social formation are. And surprise, it's called Wall Street, and their program is war and killer austerity and the crushing of the American people, the crushing of unions, the crushing of, of uh, independent political activity, and so forth. And that's ultimately what you have to deal with. So who, who does this? I call it Wall Street's parallel government. You can think of the parallel government as the guys who give the orders, and then there's a rogue network, the CIA old boys, the asteroids, who actually carry out the hits. Now, we've got to remember, the U.S. establishment is mired in fascism and Nazism. Uh, Rockefeller and Standard Oil had to deal with I.G. Farben of Germany. Farish, and this is a family close to Bush, were in there with I.G. Farben. Prescott Bush, and this is my, my great claim to fame, right, in the Bush book of 1992. Prescott Bush was linked to Tussin, who was one of the people who paid to get Hitler into power. Alfred P. Sloan of General Motors had Opel in Germany, therefore with the Nazis. Irene Dupont, General Motors, Opel, IG Farben. Henry Ford, direct admirer of Hitler. The Dulles brothers, according to some accounts, helped to put Hitler into power on the ground. Charles Lindbergh, Nazi sympathizer, America first. And the thing that all these people agreed with is that they preferred Hitler to Franklin D. Roosevelt. Mussolini, better than Franklin D. Roosevelt. And I'm sorry, libertarians, deal with it. That's the reality. Now, a couple of examples. Now, I've, I've helpfully added uh, the Jolly Roger here. And of course, this means that they're from Skull and Bones. <laughs> and Skull and Bones is with us today. So we'll see how many of them come from Skull and Bones. Not all of them, but quite a few. Colonel Henry Stimson took over the War Department in World War II. He had 10 million troops working for him. The putting of the Japanese Americans into concentration camps, that's him. The dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima is him. You think little pathetic little Ku Klux Klansman Harry Truman had anything to decide about that? No, no, no. He regarded the atomic bomb as his private toy. He was going to use it the way he wanted for the glory of his um, faction. Stimson. And he was the dean of the establishment from the 1930s 
1940s. Alan Dulles and John Foster Dulles. Now, they went to Princeton. This is not Skull and Bones. But I would, I would propose Alan Dulles in particular as the archetype of what I'm talking about. The point where Wall Street, the CIA or OSS, and the State Department intersect. This is the invisible government. Now, you'll say, well, he wasn't invisible. No, he's not invisible, but he's like an iceberg, right? The visible part is a small part of what he actually does, and it doesn't really explain why he has all this power. He tried to have a separate peace with the Nazis in Western Europe. He's the dominant figure, or they are, of the Cold War. Uh, Al, John Foster had died, but Allen was fired by Kennedy after the Bay of Pigs. Key role in the Kennedy assassination is to run the cover-up through the Warren Commission. So that's another one. John J. McCloy was the right-hand man of Stimson, and his nickname, along with one other guy we're going to see, is the Imp of Satan. Imp of Satan. The Imp of Satan. He wanted the Japanese Americans in the concentration camp because his fame was he had investigated German sabotage of munitions plants in World War I, the so-called Black Tom explosion in New York uh, Harbor. Uh, so he said, round them all up, put them in there. Not Roosevelt. These, it's a united front. Remember, they were brought into the government by Roosevelt. The Roosevelt government is a united front of Roosevelt and Roosevelt's worst enemies. It's a government of national unity to wage World War II. And if you want to write about Pearl Harbor, he's the, the most important guy in the intelligence in the War Department pre-Pearl Harbor. So he has a big part to play in setting up Pearl Harbor, not for Roosevelt, but against Roosevelt. Libertarians deal with it. Here's another one, Robert Lovett. Lovett or Leavitt as we sometimes call him. He's also from Skull and Bones. He's the other imp of Satan. So Stimson has two imps of Satan. He's got McCloy and he's got Lovett. Now Lovett, um, I guess the main thing is, this is the guy who destroyed the Kennedy administration by choosing everybody in the Kennedy cabinet. You look at the Kennedy cabinet, you say, McNamara, Rusk, who are these people? They're the ones that he chose. Kennedy essentially turned the government over to him in the first year, and that was a very bad decision. And then we have the Bundys. Harvey Hollister Bundy, another Stimson man, brought in to the War Department in World War II, and his son, McGeorge Bundy. Skull and bones, both of them. Both of them are skull and bones. Oh my God, 10 minutes, no, that's not possible. No, sorry, <laughs> not gonna happen. I can hurry up a little bit. And Averill Harriman, another skull and bones. This is who brings you the Vietnam War. And of course, McGeorge Bundy. McGeorge Bundy, Vietnam War, Kennedy assassination. And then of course, the two skull and bones uh, representatives in our own time, right? Uh, George Herbert Walker and the, and the younger. And of course today, the top warmonger in the administration, way out ahead of Obama, right? Dragging Obama into war, skull and bones, Kerry. Now, I gotta talk a little bit about how, how do we get to this. Let's check another country and see what it looks like there. Annie Lacroix is a French historian, and she's done into archives that have recently been opened. And this is her book called The Choice of Defeat. And what it says is that the French elite was so interested in union busting that they did everything possible to bring Hitler in. They opened the gates of the city to Hitler. This is the collapse of France in 1940. And here's the other one, from Munich to Vichy. This is um, the idea that French collaboration with the Nazis didn't begin once the Nazis occupied the country, but before. Before. Okay. So in the 1930s, we have two groups, I'll just mention them. One is called the Synarchy, that's the elite, right? The Synarchist Movement for the French Empire. It's based at the Banque Vorme, a big bank in Paris. So these are the elitists. Their strategy is better Hitler than the Popular Front, better Hitler than the Socialists and Communists. And the armed wing is the Cagoul, the Hood, the Secret Committee for Revolutionary Action, and ladies, 
If you're wearing L'Oreal, you're wearing the Cagoule. Uh, the goal is to destroy the French Republic, understood as big government, big government. And here's one of the things they did. The quasi-revolution, February 1934, a uh, bunch of fascists trying to storm the French National Assembly. And we had something similar here. We had a guy who wanted to come into the District of Columbia with rifles. That leads exactly to this, right? And it's something we don't want. Now, during the course of the 1930s and 20s, we have coup attempts in 1924. We have 1934, the one I've just showed you. There's an attempted coup d'etat by the Cagoule in 1937. None of them work. The one that works is the one that's associated with the military defeat. So they bring about a military defeat and use that as a cover for a successful coup. Okay? In the course of this, anybody who gets in their way, like Foreign Minister Bartu, is killed. This is a very dramatic picture. October 1934. King Alexander of Yugoslavia comes to meet the French foreign minister. They're going to be dead in a couple of minutes. And the goal of all this is Pétain, Marshal Pétain, the French fascist. So there are more kinds of fascists than people think. Now, uh, we've already had the mention of Daniele Ganzer's book on NATO secret armies. Problem again here, narrow, academic, cautious, right? Good book, good facts, but not the whole story not the Moro assassination. Here's another new one. I'm trying to keep you in touch with the best European research. This is Lanello, the ring, the ring, but it's not uh, Tolkien. This is a third Italian entity, the P2 Lodge for the elites, Gladio for street fighters, and then this is another one. This seems to be a Catholic one that was fighting the other two, perhaps, called the ring. So. What I'm trying to point to is the wealthy elite organizes itself. What do we know about the way the U.S. elite organizes itself? Well, not enough, I would say. And that's Stefania Limiti, the author of Lanello. Now, let's just tick off some of the attacks on, on uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Remember, Marshal Stalin told President Roosevelt's son in 1946, the Churchill gang poisoned your father. This is a book by Elliot Roosevelt, and he says, here's what Roosevelt was going to do after the war. Implement the Economic Bill of Rights. End the colonial empires by refusing to restore them. Keep the British out of Greece and such places. The world would be run as a U.S.-Russian condominium. That may be where we're headed today. I hope that would be much better than other alternatives. The British cut out. No Cold War. U.S. keeps prosperity by rebuilding the Russian-Soviet uh, economy and by high technology exports to the ex-colonies. He's aiming at 100 million total U.S. jobs, and he's got indictments ready to go against the pro-Nazi elements of the U.S. ruling elite, especially Alan Dulles. Now, it's not one attempt, it's not two, it's five against Roosevelt. There's an assassination attempt, three coups, and a successful poisoning. Let's just talk about it. Here's the assassination attempt. This is President-elect Roosevelt in Miami. Gunman comes, Italian anarchist, uh, kills the mayor of Chicago. Roosevelt escapes. Then the one you know, the Smedley Butler uh, uh, Dickstein Committee, okay? That's Morgan. It's not the business coup. It's the Morgan coup. I have to point out, uh, we, we're accustomed today to think of the Miami Cubans as the foot soldiers for the CIA in so many operations, Watergate, Iran, Contra, Bear Pigs. In those days, it was anti-communist Russians, white Russians, anti-Soviet Russians. And here's one of them. Major General Van Horn Mosley, he was on Pershing's staff in World War I. His plan was seize the White House with a group of white Russians in 37, 38. This is somebody who rants about the Jewish communist conspiracy. He's a Nazi sympathizer. Fascism and Nazism are good for the United States because the finest types of Americanism can breed under their protection 
and stop the communists. So he's with the German-American Bund, America First, the Gentile League, and he's for white supremacy. And then here's the, the, the other coup. This is an attempt. This is Anastasi von Siatsky, a Russian Nazi who happens to marry a very rich heiress. This is the plan to seize the White House with a group of white Russians in 41 to 42, the Russian fascist organization based in Manchuria under Japanese occupation. It's complicated, isn't it? Um, this guy, uh, well, this is where the Dodd family comes out. Thomas Dodd, right, the father of the, of the senator that you've seen, became famous in prosecuting that case. Now, Henry Wallace, um, Oliver Stone and Klutznik write about uh, Henry Wallace. They tell about Henry Wallace. Henry Wallace is a very positive figure. This is the New Deal, right? The century of the common man, pro-Soviet, anti-British, anti-colonial, pro-labor, and he's Roosevelt's insurance policy because as long as he's vice president, the British can't kill Roosevelt because they get somebody they hate even more. And the way that Wallace was eased off the ticket is called Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Yes, indeed. Roald Dahl, here he is. The British spy ring in Washington, including operations in the house on R Street. Get Wallace off the ticket so the assassination of Roosevelt can proceed. And replace him, of course, with Ku Klux Klan representative Harry Truman. Mastermind of these things, Sir William Stevenson, intrepid, the head of the British security coordination set up in Rockefeller Center after 1940. Now, the suspicions in the Roosevelt case focus on the Russian woman artist who was with FDR at the time of his death. She was present with her Russian assistant, a photographer, when the president was stricken with a cerebral hemorrhage in April 1945. Only 63 years old. She's rumored to have been implicated. She had a paint box. She had a paint box, and um, nobody ever looked at her paint box. What was in the paint box? Blue, red, green, <laughs> arsenic, strychnine, cyanide? I don't know, but that's the, uh, the idea. And that's one of her paintings. That's a painting of, of Roosevelt by Mrs. Shumatov when she met him the first time in July 1943. And there's the one from April 1945 when he looks much worse. And then, of course, his funeral. Remember, Stalin told Elliot Roosevelt, 1946, the Churchill gang poisoned your father. This cannot be simply ignored. And interestingly enough, one of the cousins of this charming lady the conductor, Igor Markevich, is accused now in Italy in the Moro assassination of being the strategic boss of the Red Brigades and ordering or even carrying out the assassination of Moro, who had been clashing, of course, with Kissinger. Now, we're getting to the end. Uh, there's a book about the other 19. I'll give you a couple of 19s. Go to the person, Colonel Marr, who commanded the air defense and ask him, why didn't you scramble all your planes and put a, uh, an umbrella over Washington, first of all, and then other uh, aspects, right? Griffiths Air Force Base, Rome, New York. Why not start with that? That's the chain of command. Don't tell me about Cheney and the young man and all this stuff. This is the person who's ordering the planes, and he sends them out over the Atlantic. And then, of course, Dave Frasca, he tells Harry Samet of the FBI, you will not open a criminal case against Zacharias Musawi. And uh, Samet calls this criminal negligence. And he's apparently still in the FBI headquarters, right? Promoted. How about, huh? He got promoted. Promoted. How about that for a couple of 19s, right? Cheney, I think this, this is uh, not to the point. Now, why has the progress been less than you'd like, right? That was the lament. Uh, of many. Well, let's look at Cass Sunstein and Mrs. Cass Sunstein. This is Samantha Power. This is now the resident warmonger who speaks for you at the United Nations. And they are the practitioners of cognitive infiltration using limited hangouts 
by the so-called whistleblowers. Now, I've developed, in my typical way, five signs of the limited hangout. The first is, you know what it's like when they don't want to give you publicity, right? You don't get on the cover of Time magazine, right? None of us has, right? Not yet. The leaker, instead, if you're part of a limited hangout, the leaker becomes an immediate media darling. Secondly, there are other leakers in the field who are much more radical. They get ignored because their stuff has not been vetted. The leaker tells the public nothing new except a few details to get credibility. Sorry. The leaker tells nothing, above all, about the main covert operations of the age. Nothing about the Kennedy assassination, nothing about 9-11, nothing about the Arab Spring. And the leaker lays the basis for new covert operations. Clearly, Ellsberg leads to Watergate, Assange leads to the Arab Spring, and Snowden leads to Russophobia. Let's just go through. Ellsberg, this is a CIA limited hangout. And I've written this up. You can find it on tobley.net. So the goal of this is to demonize the US Army, to whitewash the CIA, and to cover up the Kennedy assassination. And it's all carefully selected, carefully sanitized. And it's also designed to keep you subservient to this kind of person, to a left liberal. In other words, it wants to say, you should see him as your hero. As Mort Saul said at the time, Pity the poor leftists, they have so few heroes. When somebody comes alone, they give their heart away so easily. Assange, right, growing up in a flesh pile of drugs under MK Ultra in Australia, uh, this, is, this is a limited hangout in the sense that he puts forward a series of carefully selected things. Who suffers as a result of his revelations? Any US, British, Israeli politicians have their careers destroyed? Not a one. Who got hit? Gaddafi, Mubarak, Putin, Berlusconi, Karzai, Maliki, Kirchner of Argentina, and so forth. In other words, the, the people targeted was the CIA hit list. That's, that's who got slammed. And of course, he's got an immediate media consortium, right? In the case of Ellsberg, he's got the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Boston Globe, and, and, and. And in his case, he's got the pre-constituted international group of, uh, what, the New York Times, the Spiegel, uh, and, and a, a bunch of other newspapers around the world. Now, how about Snowden? I'm glad to hear from Wayne Madsen, and I'm glad to hear from John Young, that Snowden has revealed nothing new, except a couple of code names, right? Prism, Tempora, and uh, X Keystroke, I think it's called. But otherwise, we knew this. We knew this starting with the hearings in the European Union about Echelon, right, back 10, 12, 13 years ago. Bradley Manning, I think, is a, the case of a, a person who was victimized. He was betrayed, betrayed by the Assange network. How is it that he, he was revealed by this guy, Lamo? Lamo seems to be pretty close to uh, Assange. In this case, though, look what he accomplished. He blew up U.S.-Russian relations. And what we're seeing now this past week is that the U.S.-Russian relations are the only way to prevent the big war from breaking out in the Middle East. And he was instrumental in blowing this up. If you read Putin's interview with the Associated Press, Putin says, he called us from China. He said he wanted to come to Russia and we would fight together against the NSA. And Putin said, no. Stay where you are. Don't come here. I don't want you. Russia is not an NGO. We have our own policy. We have our own interests. We're not interested in you. Oop. Help. That's what I was afraid of. We just have a couple of more now. It's a right wing conspiracy. Right wing, I don't know, but. Uh... No, it's, it's something off the keyboard. I'm so sorry. It looks like that was the straw that broke the camel's back, huh? <laughs> Up to now, they were able to take it, but then they can't take it. Um, just bear with me, please. Are your slides on your website? Are these on your website, the slides? Tell you what, if you want my slideshow, a nominal uh, fee for handling,
call it uh, ten dollars. Get in touch with me on the uh, on the internet, and uh, I'll be glad to let you have them. It was something up here. Was it? That did it. Yeah, it's got. There, there it goes. goes. Okay. <laughs> Thank wow. you. Let's just see where we are. Okay, so you got the idea. Now, um, Salon Magazine, Herr Zeitzwald, Herr Zeitzwald attacks me. He also attacks Naomi Klein. No, I'm sorry, Naomi Wolf. Naomi Wolf. Not even Klein, Wolf, I forget which. Anyway, the, uh, the more um, prosperous one of the two. Uh, so now we have the Snowden truthers. Yes, I'm a Snowden truther. I don't believe it. I think this is a fraud. And the goal of it is to keep you subservient, to have those people as your heroes. Right? To, their mental life orients around these people. That is the goal. Let us remember that our dear friend, the gatekeeper, Gnome Chomsky, Gnome, and the poor late Howard Zinn, their careers were made for them when they became cheerleaders for Ellsberg. They said, hey, gang, Ellsberg is the way to go. A lot of people said, wait a minute. Mort Saul said, that's a CIA you know, doctored mess that they're dishing up. But that's how those careers were made. Now, one other warning. We, people say, well, we, we don't want to be political. We want to just get the facts out. The problem is, if you don't offer a political alternative, Vultures will soon arrive and eat your lunch. And that's the example of Rand Paul. Since the 9-11 Truth Movement didn't have candidates, it didn't have a political strategy, we got Ron Paul devouring, battening on, getting money, support, publicity, and now we have little Rand. So all those years of work that you put in from 2001 to 2010 or 12, Rand Paul thanks you, because that's how he got elected into the U.S. Senate. So that's the political outcome of the 9-11 Truth Movement, a reactionary, a union buster, and somebody who endorsed Mitt Romney. Yeah. Mitt Romney, the warmonger, if we'd had Mitt Romney in the White House, we'd already be at war. There would have been no question. There would have been no delay. No, no conflicted Obama, but just a warmonger. So he's running for president with fewer qualifications. He's made a deal with the neocons, as we see here. And my acid test for him is this. You oppose war, great. Pledge to lead a filibuster. Not just vote against it, not just that you filibuster it, right, with your depends, but you organize and lead a filibuster. And he is not going to do that because he wants to be president. He doesn't care about war and peace. He's an unprincipled opportunist and adventurer. Now, on the hopeful side, just a couple of more minutes. This summer and autumn are giving birth to the tax Wall Street party. You've heard of Occupy Wall Street, right? This is rather more radical, wouldn't you say? Not just occupy some park, but tax Wall Street. Get them in the labanza. Make them pay. It takes the form of a sales tax on Wall Street, the Wall Street sales tax. They deal quadrillions of derivatives. They pay zero tax. You buy a pair of shoes, you pay from 7 to 10 to 12 percent, depending on the state. And we've got a candidate for mayor, sorry, mayor of New York, and that's Randy Credico, who is a very well-known civil rights activist. He was associated with the late William Kunstler and became the head of Kunstler's um, Foundation for Racial Justice. He just did very well uh, in the New York mayoral primary. He defeated candidates who spent hundreds of thousands of dollars. And thanks to the fact that New York State does not have a sore loser law, he goes on to November, November 5th. So if you want to get peace and tax Wall Street into the final election there in New York, Credico is your man. And we're calling for two, three, many tax Wall Street parties. The goal is to intervene on the side of working people, the fast food workers, garbage, uh, sanitation people in the coming strike wave. And the goal is we don't need austerity. We don't want austerity. We won't tolerate austerity. Wall Street should pay for these things. And there's Credico getting interviewed on, uh, on New York One. You're going to hear a lot from him. I urge you to support him. And then finally, 
for uh, Civil War buffs, right? We've been living through the 150th anniversary. We had Gettysburg at the beginning of June, Vicksburg on the 4th. We're going to have Chickamauga in just a couple of days. But the biggest, I think, anniversary of uh, 1863 to 2013 is the arrival of the Russian fleets in New York City on September 24th, 1863, and in San Francisco on October 12th, 1863. And here, here are the Russian sailors on one of the Russian warships, and you can see the headlines that a new alliance is being cemented between the United States, meaning the Union, meaning Lincoln, and Tsar Alexander II of Russia, who had freed the serfs. So between the freer of the slaves and the freer of the serfs, we have this important fact. Now, you probably never heard this, right? Because this is not the stock in trade of James McPherson or others. Uh, it's completely neglected. Of course, it's embarrassing, because it's Russia doing what? Saving you from France and Britain, who wanted to intervene on the side of the Confederacy, right? Lee's invasion of Maryland, Antietam, Lee's invasion of Pennsylvania a year later, Gettysburg. Those were bids for recognition from London and Paris, from Napoleon III in Paris and Lord John Russell, Lord Palmerston, and Gladstone in London. And it was the Russian fleets and the tremendous military power of Russia that backed that up. So I invite you to attend the 150th anniversary commemoration for the arrival of the Russian fleet in New York. That was September 24th, 1863. This time it's going to be the McClendon Group at the National Press Club, Tuesday, September 24th at 7 p.m. So it's historiographical, but it's also a chance to express desire for friendly relations with Russia, since that is obviously the relation upon which the fate and peace of the world will depend. And there's, uh, this is quite a, it's, it's a considerable fleet. And they had sealed orders. If the British and the French attack Lincoln, they put themselves as part of the United States Navy, and they go out and destroy British uh, merchant shipping all over the world. And, and with that many ships and this, the other number in San Francisco, they could have done it. The, um, the question is when, uh, when the Confederate raider Alabama was reported to be uh, approaching uh, San Francisco, there were no Union vessels in the port. The Russian admiral cleared for action. So the Russian admiral was going to defend San Francisco from the Confederates. And I think that is an important uh, fact. Now, in terms of how you break through, well, the Reichstag fire teaches us, right? After the Reichstag fire in 1933, Hitler and Goering, who had done it, blamed the communists. And it has been rightly said, if Hitler had won the Second World War, the communists would be guilty today. It's only the defeat of Hitler that allowed the door to open to the truth that Goering had done it personally. So you want to break open 9-11 and these other stories? There's no legalistic way. There's no court. There's nothing like this. Break the power of Wall Street. Break the power of their rogue network break their hold over the courts and the Congress, and you'll have a pretty good chance. Right? Get the archives opened, uh, as it was done here. And finally, for each one of us, um, the question is, can you be a world historical individual? Right? Can you do anything to change the course of history, which is otherwise going to be bad? Now, this is a story from Hegel. I don't like Hegel, but this is a good story. There's the story that Hegel was in his town of Jena in Germany, and one day he came out on the way to class, and he sees Napoleon go by, right? Napoleon is on the way to fight the Battle of Jena Auerstedt in 1806. And Hegel says, I just saw the world spirit go by on a horse. Meaning, in more mundane terms, I just saw a world historical individual go by. The problem that I think with Hegel is he doesn't realize that just about anybody can be world historical. And you should try to be world historical. Um, it's very rewarding even if you don't uh, make it. 
<laughs> but trying is, and leave, leave it to somebody else to decide whether you've, uh, whether you've succeeded. Um, I think that this, these people now start to qualify as world historical individuals. They've just pulled the world back from what I think had a pretty good chance of becoming World War III. You have to remember, the Israelis, the Israelis routinely bomb Russian weapon shipments into the Middle East. The Russians send missiles to Assad. The Israelis bomb those shipments. That's extremely dangerous. The Russians start killing, the Russians start getting killed by the Israelis. That can blow the lid off the world. I don't want to see how that played out. I don't want any part of it. And as we heard at the beginning from Putin, there is an acute danger right now, today, this hour, this minute, here, to have some kind of a false flag attack on, on Israel. If you saw Assad with Charlie Rose, I think Charlie Rose is a monster, and Assad is a statesman. I think Assad is a person of calm, dignity, and great deal of determination, and he's a Syrian patriot, and these are admirable qualities. Lavrov was able to, uh, to pull this off on September 9th. Turned out September 9th is Cardinal Richelieu's birthday, right? The great diplomatist and Lavrov in his, uh, in his uh, path, uh, his, his footsteps. And therefore the question is, who can be world historical? The answer is you. <laughs> and I urge you to do it uh, in all ways, but particularly right now, help pull the world back from the brink of this conflagration in the Middle East, which is open-ended and can easily become World War III. So thank you very much. It was about an hour. Thank you. Thank you very much.